screen here. Oh. Hold on just a second. I want to. Great. All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation by Brian Eschenauer on our newest Rockland County resident, the Spotted Lantern Fly. My name is Suzanne Barkley, and I'm the Executive Director at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rockland. We will be having additional programs this year on the Spotted Lantern Fly, but we wanted to reach out first to our growers, garden centers, arborists, and others who either work outdoors or advocate for the environment because we see you as the first line of defense and we wanted to make sure you're aware of this new invasive. Today's presentation is the last in our Sustainable Suburbia series that is funded by a grant from the School of Integrative Plant Science at CALS, which is Cornell's College of Agricultural and Life Science. This series addresses three major environmental issues in Rockland, which are rampant invasive plant growth, our limited water supply and an overabundance of deer, or at least what I thought were our three main issues. Our drinking water supply is essentially limited to the rainfall that falls within our borders and is captured in the reservoirs or absorbed in our aquifers and wells. And last year, right before the pandemic shut everything down, the Rockland Water Task Force released their newly created water conservation plan. In the plan, there's a role for each of us, business, government, and community members to understand our water supply and to learn how to conserve it. And we will be presenting a series this year on water conservation in the landscape. So look out for that. Uh, in Rockland, everybody knows about our deer population. So even though a quarter of the county is protected parkland, deer can be found in suburban backyards and village downtowns as well as in our parks and woodlands. And because they need to eat from eight to 12 pounds of vegetation a day, they are literally consuming the understory and significantly affecting our local environment. And as many of you are aware, invasive plant species have established themselves throughout the county from the Phragmites that have taken over the Piedmont Marsh the Japanese knotweed along our rail trails and barberry along the Palisades Interstate Parkway. These plants are changing our local environments and will potentially affect or replace other flora and fauna. But it turns out we should really be referring to invasive species and not limited to plants. And that's because of the arrival of the spotted lanternfly, our newest invasive insect. Our speaker today, Brian Eschenauer, is the Senior Extension Associate, Associate affiliated with the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program since 2006. His areas of expertise include integrated pest management, plant diagnostics, plant pathology, among others. After his presentation, we'll open the floor for questions. Uh, although uh, Mr. Eschenauer is saying that he will entertain questions during his presentation. Uh, if you're not familiar with the chat box, look for the white bubble at the bottom of the screen and simply click on it, type in your question and press enter, and I'll make sure that Mr. Eschenauer hears it. At the end, uh, we'll, we'll show you a link to an online survey, which is a chance for you to give us feedback about this presentation. But if you have to leave early or somehow miss it, I can email it to you. Finally, I want to thank our communications manager, Charlie Payne, who makes sure these presentations happen, and our horticultural educator, Kristen Osman, who has partnered with me in our Sustainable Suburban Series. So again, thank you for attending. And now I'd like to turn the screen over to Brian Eschenauer. Well, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And yes, I, I agree that, um, you know, uh, I wanna answer your questions as we move along here um, with this presentation on spotted lanternfly. And there you can see the bright colored image of spotted lanternfly with its wings spread open. So it is um, an attractive insect uh, and very distinctive with the polka dots and the orange color. This is more often how it's seen so it can be a little bit camouflaged, and we'll show some images of that a little bit later on. But uh, they do like to group together. Took this image in 
uh, Pennsylvania, where they're actively feeding on an Atlantis or a tree of heaven. But let's talk a little bit about this insect and, um, you know, its background, how it arrived here in um, the US and in New York now. So it is a plant hopper. You know, it looks a lot like a moth to me. You know, if you look at it, uh, it's about an inch long. It's got that gray coloration, even though it has the spots, but it's a plant hopper and plant hoppers are sucking insects. So they don't chew, they don't leave a hole anywhere. Uh, except for a little hole that would be similar to what you would have if you would uh, put a needle into a plant. So not anything that's really noticeable. Um, they are, this plant hopper, we have some native ones, but this one is native to China and Vietnam. Um, it feeds on over 70 different species in the United States. And that number is actually growing. We're finding that it's on more and more plants but definitely its preferred host is the tree of heaven. This is an invasive species that is distributed throughout the United States. And um, it really does well when it has this for a while. In fact, until just last year, um, some people believe that it was required that this insect have the tree of heaven to uh, feed on it because it was always associated with it. But they did some studies where they were able to isolate this insect and have it uh, complete its life cycle without access to the tree of heaven. And uh, it was able to survive, although it wasn't quite as fit and didn't lay as many eggs when it didn't have access to the tree of heaven. But it likes grapes, as you're going to see, hops and apples are some of the preferred hosts. And there's also agronomic hosts, uh, some weeds and, and other plants that it may be on. Um, let's take a look at this map. So the blue is where it was established, and this map is uh, a few years old. I have a current map that I'll show you later, but I just wanted to show you where the kind of the ground zero for this was. And that's right in uh, this area here in uh, Pennsylvania, in Lehigh County. It um, it was believed that it arrived with stone, uh, landscaping stone, to a, a stone yard there, um, you know, well north of Philadelphia. And um, that stone arrived from Korea. So, you know, I didn't know we were importing landscape stone from all over, but uh, we were. And in Korea, this insect is not uh, native there. It's also invasive. In the locations where it's native in China and Vietnam, it's not really a problem. There are other insects that feed upon it. Um, it's just at a low level in the landscape. But when it arrived in Korea, it spread quickly and became quite a nuisance there. Um, and it, it's doing the same for us. So uh, the tan colored spots are where it was found, but not established. So these were individual finds of often dead insects. And it just shows that this is a hitchhiker and can move around in that way. And so some of the movement uh, on its own, it can only move three to four miles uh, a year. So it's not very uh, quick to move. And, but unfortunately, it is an excellent hitchhiker. The adults can wind up in all kinds of things. When I was in um, Maryland this year in an area that had a lot of spotted lanternfly. I could see them bumbling around. They got into the seam between the back of the car and the trunk. Um, there, there is a case uh, a little bit uh, north of you in the Hudson Valley where somebody was down in Pennsylvania. They opened their trunk and there they found some live spotted lanternfly that got in when they stopped um, at an area to, to buy some things. I think it was an outlet in Pennsylvania that's in this quarantine zone. So they can get in to um, a lot of different areas. And then we're really concerned about the egg masses because the adult spotted lanternflies can lay those egg masses on nearly any surface. And they seem to like rusty metal, which is often associated with trucks and with trains. Uh, we're really concerned about the rail corridors. 
So um, it is moved by human activity of all kinds. And so it's important to check anything that's coming out of the quarantine zone for all of the life stages. And in fact, there are regulations that um, trucks that are coming out of that quarantine zone, we can go back and take a look at it in PA, which has increased since this map, and I'll show you the current one, but they need to have a certification that they've done a training so that they can inspect their vehicle to make sure they're not carrying spotted land and fly with them. All right, um, as I mentioned, they can only move on their own about three to four miles a year. And that, you know, they would be lucky to do that. They're not excellent flyers. They're kind of a big insect. Uh, if you go, if you're in an area where they are, you know, they kind of bumble along uh, and they'll bump into you. And, um, you know, I'll I say it again, but they don't bite or they don't sting, but they can be a, a big concern. So this is a little video that I'll show it. And it just, the red dot that you're seeing there is one of the insects and they were able to track it through the uh, sky here. So we'll get this moving. And there you can see it flying. This is in a vineyard. And uh, yeah, it's just moving along there, you know, not straight and fast, but just kind of meandering along. But when you have them doing that on mass, you know, they can cause uh, concern and uh, they can, if they catch, get caught up into a thermal, uh, it was found recently that they can travel for a longer distance on their own. And that's probably where we're getting those uh, multiple miles. Otherwise, they fly for a while, they land, catch their breath, basically they probably feed, and then they, they climb up to high points in the tree or in a vineyard, and then uh, kind of launch off from there and they'll fly into the wind because their aerodynamics are best when they do that. All right. But they are swarm feeders, so they like to be together and they feed on the phloem. So they feed on the pipework of the tree. We have got xylem and phloem there. The phloem is uh, coming down from the leaves. It's rich in sugars. It's enriching the roots and the rest of the tree. They tap into that. They know with their needle that they're sticking in there, their proboscis, uh, basically a straw that they're able to penetrate the bark and locate that phloem, which is sugar rich, and they're sucking that out. And uh, there it is on trees. And here it is, this is, we're getting into why we're really concerned about it. It's not just a curiosity, it's not just a nuisance, but it can feed on grapes. And it doesn't feed here, you know, they're intermixed with the clusters of the grape, of the fruit, but uh, they're actually not feeding on the fruit at all. Um, they're feeding on the grape vines. And this is a video as well. And we're gonna see what happens when they feed. They have microbes in their gut that is able to extract nutrients from the sap that they're pulling out. But they need to process a lot of sap to get the proteins that they need and have those microbes work on it. So um, they're pushing a lot of liquid through their bodies and we're gonna see that here. So here they are um, feeding on the vines. The ones that are stationary are actively feeding and we're gonna see something happen here where um, these, this, it was not raining, you can see it's pretty sunny, but uh, did you see this? It's coming out of the backside. So she's, this insect is tapped in to the vascular tissue. And I'm gonna go back there and look at this. This is honeydew that's coming out. So this is a, a sugary substance that's actually coming out of that, uh, the back end of that insect. It, it was processed, they extracted some of the proteins that they needed, and then that sugary material is coming out. Well, on top of that sugary material, um, 
a mold can grow. And that's one of the reasons it's a nuisance in the um, backyard. And there you can see more of that happening. When I was around uh, some of them in a tree in Pennsylvania, it almost felt like it was raining because that, that honeydew was coming down on my head and, and arms. So um, a nuisance for us, but for the grape growers, it is a concern. And you know, you're just on the edge there in Rockland County of a really important uh, grape growing region in the Hudson Valley. But in New York State, we've got a lot of really important grape growing regions. And we can start here in Long Island, move to the Hudson Valley. Finger Lakes, of course, is a big uh, wine growing region. And then it just shows up here as a sliver. But uh, this is really important. Most of the world's Concord grapes, and this is, you know, you buy grape jelly at the grocery store or that dark purple grape juice is grown in this region along Lake Erie. It extends into Pennsylvania as well. So grapes are, are really important to us in New York. And in fact, in New York State, there are 470 wineries, 900 grape farms, 35,000 acres. Uh, it's a really important for tourism, over 5 million visitors per year, and that's just been increasing. And um, I understand Rockland County has one uh, vineyard so far, but you know, who knows, maybe there's gonna be an opportunity for more there. And that tourism spills over if uh, there, you know, people don't just stay within the county where they're going to the wineries. And that is a huge uh, economic impact with 6.6 .6 billion um, that's coming into the New York economy. And it's, it's increasing. This is from January of uh, 2020. And um, they say that the New York wine industry is showing significant growth. So it's something, it's a reason that uh, we're concerned about spotted lanternfly. And this slide illustrates it. So you saw that, you know, they were feeding there. That's a nuisance, but take a look at this image on the right. This is a dead vineyard due to spotted lanternfly feeding. So they had a heavy feeding year. The um, grower acknowledged that. They weren't gonna treat that year. It was kind of a, um, just they were learning about it. And they thought, okay, now we'll go ahead the following year and treat. And sadly, in this vineyard, uh, the vines didn't recover. So this is well into the growing season. All of those vines should be green with foliage. They should have fruit on them. And, and they don't, uh, sadly, due to spider lanternfly. So this is what we really want to pre prevent from happening in New York. And this is another image from Pennsylvania. Our Pennsylvania colleagues have been sharing a lot of really good information because um, you know, we don't want this to happen, of course, in New York with our really important grape and wine industry. Um, take a look here. So what you're seeing at the base of the vines there are dead spotted lanternflies. The spotted lanternflies uh, respond well to our insecticides, I should say. They're, they're pretty easy to kill. So we can have um, a good result by treating the vines that have the spotted lanternfly on them. However, the problem is we can get almost complete control or really complete control of the spotted lanternflies on the vines. Sadly, however, they can come back in from the surrounding forest and in five days, you could see just as many as you did before because they love grapes so much. And so that's what pre presents a particular challenge. It's kind of like other pests that we see. Normally, you can get pretty good control. You can have some residual action. This one, because it also feeds on the woodlands, uh, on a lot of different types of trees, it can move right back into its favorite host. And we do see an edge effect. If um, a, a vineyard manager is looking for spotted lanternfly, it will most likely show up around the border where it's moving in from trees. 
Brian. Um, yes. Someone asked, uh, so are you saying that spotted lanternfly can kill a plant in a year, like a grape plant? Is sadly, yes. You know, that's unusual. Most diseases and insects, it takes a while for the uh, plant to be weakened. This, if the spotted lanternfly is left unchecked and there's enough damage, um, enough weakening of it, it will not bounce back after the winter. The, it, it's kind of the season when most spotted lanternfly damage occurs for grapes is um, into the fall and it sets the plant up not to have enough reserves to make it through the winter. So yes, it can happen in one year. Fortunately, as I'll, I'll say as we go on, it is not killing our landscape trees in that way. They're only seeing a little bit of dieback in some maple trees and, and it's more of just a nuisance and it's not even widely spread in our landscape trees. Grapes happen to be particularly vulnerable to this. And I, while I'm thinking of it, I will mention that wild grapes that are very common in forested areas and you know just unkept areas, even in backyards that might be growing on fences because a bird has eaten a wild grape and it's gone through the digestive system, system and has sprouted, uh, the wild grapes are very attractive to spotted lanternfly. And if you have those, you may have more spotted lanternfly in your backyard. So it's really important to uh, grape growers, but uh, they did a study in Pennsylvania to look at the economic impact of spotted lanternfly because it can affect other things, uh, other plants as well. Uh, nursery crops can be affected, not because they're uh, damaged, but rather because they might transport the uh, spotted lanternfly and so there would be a lot of control of the spotted lanternfly so that you're not moving it to a non-quarantined area and so when we get quarantines in new york that's going to be an issue for us um, so that's something coming up anyway they have some of those quarantines in pa they looked at the cost and you know they're looking at 50 million dollar loss uh, they equated that to jobs and uh, worst case scenario, if it spreads to the counties that are suitable for it to spread to, and it's not every place, uh, like the Adirondacks for sure will not have a growing season that's long enough to support a spotted lanternfly. There's places in the mountains of Pennsylvania that also uh, we're anticipating will not see spotted lanternfly. But in that worst case scenario, they're looking at uh, 50. Uh, 554 million uh, annually and um, a total of uh, around 5,000 lost jobs. So this insect could cause a lot of damage. And I was saying earlier as I was connecting that um, there is a spotted lanternfly summit. We had our first session yesterday and this is a multi-state um, gathering of regulators and extension folks throughout the country I believe it was a total of about 30 states that were represented and you know California was one of them because this insect could do well there and of course they have a huge wine industry uh, but even we had uh, participants as far away as Hawaii because there will be climatic zones even in Hawaii where this insect can survive and do well and so we want to prevent the spread of this and the economic loss that uh, they've started to experience in Pennsylvania. It's affected their forestry industry too, which is pretty big in PA, the lumber industry, because of uh, quarantines. Here it is. So it can occur on um, apples. And uh, this was surprising for them to see it. See, I think I have a couple of their shots of this a little bit later on, but um, there it is again, swarm feeding. If you're uh, an apple grower, especially when this was first seen a couple of years ago, um, you're gonna be alarmed. But uh, fortunately the apple trees, unlike the grapes have been able to survive this. They're not seeing any die back there. And it, you can see again, they're leaving the fruit alone. They're just uh, sucking the juices out of the 
the apple tree and the pipework of the tree itself. So here's where we are now. And so the blue areas represent counties where there is an active infestation. Uh, and it's not the entire county, especially in New York. Um, we just added a few within the last month in New Jersey. And the regulator from New Jersey who talked to me wanted to be sure that I knew that uh, even though most of the counties, uh, all but two, have it, it's not spread throughout the county, but there is an area in there that has uh, spotted lanternfly. So Rockland County is completely lit up, but it is only in the Slotesburg area right now. So, uh, and so that's in, you know, Western uh, Rockland County. There's a little infestation in Orange County as well. And then um, in Tompkins County, and I'll show you that in a second, how that got started, but you know, that's right in the Finger Lakes area of the, uh, where the wine is, industry is big. And, you know, you're at the Southern end of the Hudson Valley, which, um, you know, has a huge wine industry as well. You know, Brian, we were informed by uh, Lower Hudson Valley Prism that it has also been, uh, eight cases have been seen in Orangeburg. So yes. it's the opposite uh, end of uh, Rockland in the southernmost area. Okay. I, I knew about the Orangeburg one, but I wrongly assumed that that was Orange County. So I don't know my geography down there. Thank <laughs> you for pointing that out. <laughs> it is also in Orange County, and I forget the, um, I think it's right you know, near the Slotesburg area. But yeah, it is definitely in Orangeburg. And I can tell you, at a meeting yesterday, um, the head of Ag and Markets that is working on this, it, they're, they're deciding what their action is going to be at all of these spots. And sadly, a, a year ago, there were no spots in New York State that had it. So they're trying to deal with all of these at the same time. Uh, the first one happened in the summer, um, July and August. It was identified at a park on st in Staten Island. Now we're informed um, that it is throughout Staten Island. And so in 2021 20, uh, here, 2022, 2023 is really when we're expecting it to kind of blow up and the population is to really build up. That's when we'll be hearing about this on the news. And I'm gonna show you what's kind of happened in the Philadelphia area. And you may have heard about it, there was also a case where a ship, I don't have an image of this, but um, a cargo ship was in Philadelphia and moved up to, uh, to Brooklyn and was going to unload there, but it had spotted lanternfly on it and it, it, it made the news in that area. So um, it actually didn't come to port. They, did, they were able to uh, control the spotted lanternfly. They can't survive very long without a host. So um, during the growing season, the eggs can. And this is why I wanna show the egg masses here because this is what all the spotted lanternflies in the US look like right now, what we're seeing on the right. So in the fall, those adult females there laid those egg masses and the egg masses are chains of eggs that are about one inch long. And you can see that here. This is an individual egg there laid in lines like this, eight or 10 on average, but you know that can vary. And then the female will most often cover them with a mud-like substance that uh, she produces to protect the eggs over the winter from predators and uh, from weathering a little bit. It helps them adhere. And that uh, material that uh, the female puts down is a, um, a you know, like a, a substance that is very smooth. It is lighter colored at first, and then it ages to be pretty camouflaged to a typical bark color. But uh, as I mentioned, that they can lay these on anything, including uh, lawn furniture. I've seen them on hats that were left out in the fall, um, you name it, um, 
they don't, they're not uh, particular, very indiscriminate on where they lay their eggs, but they too do tend to lie on, lay their eggs on the underside of um, whatever it is. So um, they can even lay them on rail lines, but it would be kind of under that flange. So you'd have to have a mirror to uh, see them there. There are dogs that have been trained to um, the scent of these egg masses. And they're the initial ones that uh, cued us in that, yeah, they're on rail lines and they're underneath that flange because who would have thought to get down there and look under the top of uh, a rail line. So this is one that got our attention. So here it is, the spotted lanternfly egg mass that showed up last November in um, Ithaca. And this is uh, a branch removed from a tree and set on the ground there, but this was on the underside of that branch. And you can see, you know, unless you knew you were looking for that, um, it might not be easy to identify. Uh, an entomology student uh, who was familiar with spotted lanternfly that went to, that goes to Cornell, um, thought that, you know, that looked like it could be and quickly it was verified and the state came in and did a great job to delineate exactly where it was in this area, like they've done in the Hudson Valley as well. And uh, this, this is a small infestation. They hope to uh, try to control it in Rockland County, in Orange County, and um, in this one, with this one in Spot, uh, Tompkins County in Ithaca. Um, I think it's uh, just gonna, because it's spread throughout Staten Island, that's gonna be a tricky one. I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of effort there in management. So there will, there will be some natural spread from there. So it's kind of like emerald ash borer. It's inevitable that it will spread, but unlike emerald ash borer, it's not gonna kill trees as it moves along. So we looked at the egg masses there and they are out in, um, uh, starting in October, late September, you might see a few egg masses and uh, they remain that way until about June. And depending on the weather, they'll hatch uh, sometime late May or June. And they look actually like uh, small ticks with um, spots on them. They, they start out very small. You see the egg masses, they crawl out of those tiny little eggs. And, but they also, are feeding in the way that the same way the adult does. They're not chewing anything. They're putting their proboscis in and sucking the juices out and growing bigger. They have several molts. And then in the summer around July, they develop this red color. And with their uh, final molt, they, uh, you know, and this is kind of like a cocoon that they go into, they emerge as this adult plant hopper and um, with the wings and the spots. And uh, these are the only stages that can fly. The others are just crawlers. And these others um, will feed on everything. Uh, they really like raspberries. They can be found in weedy areas. It's the adults that really gravitate to the trees. Although all stages can feed on um, the uh, trees as well. This is an image that's from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture on the left there that, you know, you can see why homeowners get concerned. That's pretty dramatic to see a tree that's just packed with these insects and the arborists in the area are doing controls so that uh, people don't have to see this. And also the honeydew, if we take a look at the image on the right, so all those insects, you saw what was happening in that little video that I showed. They're excreting this honeydew. And on top of that honeydew, it's a food source. Something's going to feed on it. This mold called sooty mold feeds on it. So those stairs there were all coated. The bottom stair was uh, power washed. And you can see the color it should be. But rather, it's coated in that honeydew, which can be slippery. So with a little rain, that could be uh, actually a hazard there on the steps. And um, yeah, it doesn't look good. And, and it's kind of messy if it's on the handrail as well, which it is. 
uh, it's not something you want to put your hand on. Uh, it's not toxic. It's not a problem, but it is uh, a, a nuisance and, and could be a hazard in the way of, uh, you know, a slip accident. And so I have an image of a honeybee and a yellow jacket there. And that's because with all the honeydew that's produced, these guys are attracted to that. It's almost like nectar to them. So you can have more yellow jackets in an area where you have spotted lanternfly. And uh, honeybees, and this is just recent that they found the honeybees are attracted to the uh, honeydew as well. And they're bringing that back to the hive as if it was nectar. I attended a, a meeting of researchers a couple of years ago in Pennsylvania, and they were kind of just figuring this out at the time, but they had some honey that was produced from an area that had a lot of spotted lanternfly, and the honey had an off taste to it. Um, and uh, it is, they were able to determine through some um, signatures that are in the honey that, yeah, it came through um, a portion of that anyway, was from spotted lanternfly honeydew. And there's actually a company that is marketing, should have had a slide of this, but they're marketing um, spotted lanternfly honey. It has a distinctive flavor, an earthy flavor. Um, I tried a little bit. I wouldn't choose that. I don't think I want earthiness in my honey, but you know, it's something different. So. Uh, and there's no known toxins that are produced by the uh, spotted lanternfly. So that's a good thing. And we've had questions like, oh, my dog has eaten spotted lanternfly. Things pop up on social media. And so we put out some of uh, the myths about uh, spotted lanternfly. It does not bite. It does not sting. It's not toxic. If your dogs eat it, they might get sick because there's an irritant in their stomach with this insect parts, but it doesn't have a toxin to it. And so that is one of the myths that uh, was propagated this year on social media. So um, there is this narrative that's out there in Pennsylvania, you know, if you see a spotted lanternfly, kill it. They really promoted that through the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and um, you know, it's good. We don't wanna spread this insect, but um, you know, I have a little bit of a concern about a knee jerk reaction. You see an insect and kill it right away. Be and it's not gonna make a huge impact because of the thousands of insects that build up and the fact that they're high up in the tree canopy. If we're killing you know, a few hundred on the ground, we're not gonna make a huge uh, impact in the overall population, but uh, it has quite, caused quite a stir. And um, yeah, I, it's um, you know not truly a nightmare, but it may seem it. If you're seeing a lot of these, um, you know, that's a personal reaction to it. Um, but in the Philadelphia Inquirer, they had to let people know the police were getting inundated by calls you don't call 911 to report spotted lanternfly invasion. So it's on Staten Island now. It's working its way into Manhattan. We are preparing, we're working with extension offices throughout the state so that we get the message out there. There's no need to panic. It's not gonna kill your trees. Uh, yes, it's gonna be a nuisance. If you're a grape grower, you gotta take precautions. And we have uh, in our grape specialists are prepared with the best, most current, um, ways to manage that, uh, but don't call 911. And one of the ways that uh, lo we're looking at the way it may have moved is through uh, the transportation corridors. And so along um, the road and railways. And yeah, I took this uh, little video in Pennsylvania just on the margins of where this was when I took this in um, 2019, uh, this county was first identified. This is Dolphin County in Pennsylvania there. So here's a spotted lanternfly on an Atlantis tree, that tree of heaven. And um, 
as this moves on, we're going to just be able to see a, a train that's here. And this is a, a rail corridor. So I was standing right about there and looking at this train as it was moving along. And likely this guy got here from um, train movement. So if you live along a rail line, um, you know, that's one of the first places our New York inspectors are looking. All right, and this is the tree of heaven. I spoke a lot about this, but I wanna show you this uh, picture as we kind of wrap things up here, because this is one of the things you can do. The first places that this will be, if you're kind of monitoring for this, will be on the Atlantis tree. There's no doubt about it. And you have a lot of them in Rockland County. They're spread throughout the state. There's not very many of them in the Adirondacks, but any disturbed area along rail lines, along roadways, in people's backyards. I've seen them as, in land, as landscape trees. Um, they're not planted, but you know, once they're there, people, you know, you, you can like it. It's a big tree. Um, the novel, the coming of age novel, novel, A Tree Grows in Brooklyn was about a tree of heaven. That's a really quick growing a survivor. Um, the, um, it is an invasive species, but let's take a look at it. One of the ways you'll know it is an Atlantis and not a black walnut is the lobes that are at the base of the leaflet. And there's a lot of good information out there now. We have some on our website. Uh, there's some on the Penn State website on identifying what a tree of heaven looks like. This is what it looks like in flower. There are male and female trees. Uh, they're using some of these as trap trees. So they're taking the male trees that won't set seed, um, removing some of the female trees. It's hard to do because they will re-sprout from the trunk. So it takes some effort to actually remove some of these. But um, the male trees are treated with a systemic insecticide. And then hundreds, if not thousands, of spotted lanternflies end up dead at the base of the tree. And uh, there you can see a picture of a couple that I took there. And you get to, to know what they look like because they're a protrusion on the, uh, the trunk. So you can even see them as you're driving along um, or, you know, you're a passenger in a car. You're, if you're driving, you're paying attention to the road. But um, these guys stick out. They're kind of camouflaged there. So you have to get close to look at them. And uh, here on the right, you can see, you know, for a polka dotted insect, they don't stand out too well. Um, but uh, once you know what to look for, you can see them. So I really encourage you to keep an eye out for these. Um, they're in your county. They sadly probably will be spreading. And uh, we, Ag and Markets wants to know about this. You can let your extension office know, take a picture, uh, let them know, bring it into um, the office there, the lab, and they can verify what that is. But if you do see it, there's a place on our New York State IPM website uh, that has a link where you can report that. You can send your image in and um, the location and um, they'll verify it because we want to know every place that is spreading. And potentially, uh, we're going to have the state come in and extinguish some of these outlying populations. So I already talked about this. Um, this is just where we expect it to move to in the U.S., the darker the color. So those red areas are where it's anticipated that the spider lanternfly will do well. And um, some take home messages as we wrap up here. We want to learn to identify all the life stages of the spider lanternfly. Definitely the adults are going to be most noticeable. Um, and when, if it is in an area or you're traveling to the quarantine zone, which is getting bigger and bigger, um, really, um, take a look at your car before you leave, especially in the summertime or the fall, um, check your vehicle. And if you see it, report it, please, uh, do that. Um, the extension office has links to information on the spotted lantern fly and they have the reporting link there as well. 
Um, our New York State IPM program that I'm involved with also has that map where it's located currently. And on that same page, it has the reporting link. Just uh, a little bit of good news as we wrap up here. Uh, there's a lot of work that's taking place. We were doing this before it was in New York State. Um, we're, we are working with extension offices throughout uh, the state. We have a listserv where we're getting information out on a regular basis. As new information comes in, it's going right out to all of our extension offices. Um, we're working interstate with other researchers. As new information comes in, we're able to be to tap in to that. And the second one here um, is kind of a cool thing. This is an insect that has um, an infection of a fungal disease. And uh, we have researchers on campus in an isolation area at Cornell that are looking at these. Um, there's two organisms that ha have been found naturally in the US that are attacking under the right conditions spotted lanternfly. So some natural biological control, we're looking at how um, that can be isolated, maybe sprayed on so that we can control these insects in a natural way. In some cases, uh, they might build up naturally on their own. And that's what we have with gypsy moth right now. It builds up, it's a problem. And then the populations collapse because of some of the natural uh, pathogens that are out there. Um, are there any questions that you see there? Because it looks That's like fine. Um, you talked about the uh, natural pathogens. What what uh, artificial or pesticide is used? Yeah, that that is a good question. There are not a whole lot of products that are out there, so we are limited to what the label says, and. In the past, there haven't been a lot of plant hoppers that we needed to control. So there's not a lot of insecticides that have plant hopper on the label. Uh, there are some that arborists will be able to use. And we have that list on our New York State IPM website and commercial growers can use. We're working with entomologists to expand the list for those homeowners to use. Um, it's a kind of fragile insect. So if you took a hose to it, you could easily knock them down uh, off the tree. The problem is that they would uh, climb back up. There's also some traps that are out there. Uh, we're learning a lot more about those uh, in Pennsylvania, and we're going to have some more information about that uh, for this summer as the insects increase. But uh, yes, yeah, stay tuned. Take a look at our uh, website because we're updating the products that are available. There's not much that's um, allowed for use right now. The good news is a lot of products work on it. We just have to make sure we're doing that legally. Um, I will mention there's some home remedies that are out there. Uh, there's some, there were some things in Pennsylvania where people were using Windex um, and that knocks them down and it may even kill an individual insect. But um, you know what? You, in New York um, or, or anywhere really, when you use something as a pesticide that doesn't have an EPA registration on it, it's not a legal use. So keep the Windex for the windows and we'll have uh, insecticides available for you to use. And, Fine. and yeah, yes, go ahead. You had mentioned quarantine zones, but we don't have those in New York. So could we you- We do not. Those? We do not yet. We they are looking at that very closely, um, and they may be established. We do not have any quarantine for this um, this insect at all, and I'm not sure. It it's the, the, I was on a call yesterday with um, the head of Ag and Markets that's looking at this, and I don't know if they even know if, how or when or if they'll establish a quarantine because it, it gets so complicated. And for an insect that probably is gonna spread everywhere it can, how effective would that be? Uh, and it certainly affects commerce. So um, stay tuned on that. 
Um, would you say, Brian, that one of the easiest solutions that a homeowner could take is to remove a tree of heaven? Um, it can be very effective. However, it's not easy because tree of heaven has this ability. When you cut um, the tree down, it'll sprout from the trunk or from the roots. So there's where uh, it would be a combination of cutting it down using an herbicide and following up with any sprouts that might appear because those sprouts are succulent, they're growing really quickly. They are super attractive to the spotted lanternfly. So it would be a combination of both. But yeah, if you were uh, diligent and were able to make sure that you kill it, that would reduce the populations, especially right near you. But in some cases, you know, the tree of heaven has become an important landscape feature. And, you know, somebody might not want to do that. And arborists are treating in that area, the, near the Philadelphia area in the suburbs, and are able to manage it in that way. And it's, it's kind of been a, a boon for some of the arborists there to offer their services to control that. And um, garden centers in the area in Pennsylvania have whole sections on spotted lanternfly traps and the insecticides that are available to control it in uh, Pennsylvania. So um, expect if you are in the garden center business that you will be asked this, but it's really gonna take some time before it builds up. I'm really thinking even in Staten Island where it's spread throughout the residential areas now, we're hearing that uh, 2022 and 2023 is really where it's gonna build up, where it's starting to swarm. And so I think we're looking even further out for an area like Rockland County. Um, another question, Brian. Um, someone says that they spray a dormant oil on their apple trees every year, late March, early April. Uh, will that oil kill these eggs? That is an excellent question. And logic tells us that it should. But the research from Pennsylvania is very mixed. Um, they've looked at several different oils, and in some cases, the oils worked well. They did the same study the following year, and the egg survived. So it might have been a combination of weather and the oils. And I will mention that cold weather, and we've had some certainly this year, does not affect the eggs. They can go to significantly below zero and survive. So unfortunately, we can't count on that. Um, the oils, we're still waiting to know which oil and when it should be applied, if we can get control with the oils. Uh, a lot of other insect eggs can be easily smothered when they're coated with those horticultural oils we can use. This one, not quite as simple. And then finally, there's a, a request uh, asking you to share a link for products allowed in New York State. I will do that. Um, and I don't know if you all, you all probably have the, the list of the registrants. I could send this information to you. I could send those links and then you could send them out if you wanted to do that. Sure. Or well, why don't I end the show and I can just put it in so you can have that immediately too. Okay. Any other questions out there? All right, well, uh, Brian, I think you've answered them all. Thank you so very much. Uh, you know, I think we're fortunate here in Rockland in that we have a good working relationship with Lower Hudson Prism. And we also have a large number of very active Master Gardener volunteers. That's and great. They will be all over the spotted lantern fly. So, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, the Prism, I didn't mention the Prisms, but they're on our listserv and yeah, they've been great. They've really been um, proactive with spotted lanternfly. Yeah. So if anyone wants to stay on, I will put that in the chat, but if you have to go, I understand that. And uh, yeah, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Brian. It was an excellent presentation.
and uh, I'm sure we'll be hearing from New York State IPM uh, in the future around spotted and entrance flies. So yeah, sadly, <laughs> we probably will be talking a lot about spotted lantern fly in the future. And Charlie, if you could uh, show the link to the uh, survey, otherwise I can send it out to uh, participants. Uh, that would be great. So if people can look in the chat, uh, there's a link to a survey. And if uh, you can't do it at this moment, um, I can easily send it to you. But we'd love to hear what you thought. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please look for um, additional presentations, because as I mentioned, we will be talking about spot and lantern flight a lot this year. So thank you all, have a good afternoon. So Charlie, I'm gonna put this link in.